I think what's really changed is that seeing things like ChatGPT, MidJourney, I mean, there's this dizzying array of tools that started to crop up really all around us in this sort of moment of extreme hype that we're in. So there is a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I think the biggest thing has changed is people's mental models have changed. The idea of like, oh, maybe this is possible. Maybe I could have this system that creates a conversational interface around all of this different data. Maybe I can do that pretty quickly. From Tyler Technologies, it's the Tyler Tech Podcast, where we talk about the issues facing communities today and highlight the people, places, and technology making a difference. I'm Beth Ingman. I'm the Corporate Marketing Manager here at Tyler, and I appreciate you joining me for another episode of the Tyler Tech Podcast. Today, we are joined by Kyle Hall, the Director of Product Management for Tyler's Data and Insights Division, to discuss the more technical side of data management software and get into some future trends. Kyle, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes. Well, our listeners who have been with us for a while will know that the Data and Insights Division personnel have been very much included in our podcast recently. We talked with Franklin Williams, the president, and Saf Raba, our vice president of Data Solutions. And so we're excited to have you here to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of the technical side of things. Before you were working with what was Socrata and then Tyler Technologies. You and I have gotten to work together for a good while now. I know that you were with the city of Los Angeles and worked in a number of capacities, building open data projects and dashboards and visualizations and a lot of analysis related to city financials and performance data. So you've been with Tyler now for a good while, but you spent so much time in government. And so I'm really interested in hearing from your point of view What has changed in how government approaches data management since you were last working in government? Yeah, absolutely. Well, a lot has definitely changed over the last uh, last decade. Uh, I think first and foremost, you know, when I was working in government, cloud management, cloud systems was kind of the new thing coming. Um, But still, the majority of the work we were doing was on premise. Uh, We spent a lot of time thinking about the hardware in our data center and how we could manage and improve and manage costs there. And I think. That sort of wave of transition to the cloud has not only come, it is, I think, sort of past controversy at this point. The vast majority of the governments we're working with are adopting more of a cloud-first mindset, even in very high compliance spaces like public safety, like court management. Uh, the technology has just improved. The security um, has improved. And really, a lot of the policy and understanding is really a lot more mature than it was about you know, when I was working in government. A lot of the difficulty in incorporating some of these new systems and technologies is not just about the technology. It's about how that technology fits in with procurement policy, how it fits in with security and IT policy, how um, whether the staff and expertise exist to manage those systems within a government. And really that knowledge, that cultural shift, that policy shift is is extremely widespread at this point. And now we're standing at sort of a, a, a different kind of inflection point because, you know, as there's been this shift to the cloud, that makes data a lot more accessible. And so similarly, a lot of the things that were uh, maybe considered cutting edge or more risky projects several years ago are now much more routine, I'd say. So we're seeing a lot of governments that are moving forward with transparency projects based on live data. And the controversy around that is much lower than it used to be. We're seeing a lot of governments really move forward with trying to explore AI and process automation and some of these wraparound services that can uh, be effectively used when you have your data highly accessible and in a well-managed space. And, you know, you, you just see a lot more maturity and a lot more understanding of the opportunities, as well as the risks and challenges that come along with a more cloud-native, data-forward approach to running a government. It's interesting to think about cloud as being something that was so unfamiliar because it is such a huge part of our everyday lives as consumers and obviously for you and me and our everyday work. I I think it's interesting that you talk about the comfort that's there now, that these are no longer cutting edge or scary innovations, but you did also mention cybersecurity, that these are not as scary anymore because there's also so much more security associated with having solutions in the cloud versus in on-premises. It sounds like there's so much exciting stuff still to come though. And it sounds like that governments have a lot to choose from and are maybe feeling more comfortable now with these innovative technologies. And so thinking about from when you were working in government to when you are now working with government, what are the capabilities that governments are most excited about implementing and leveraging? Yeah, absolutely. Well, 
a lot of government process started in paper, right? And since those very early times, the problems associated with paper are pretty well understood. Like things can get lost. It can take a long time to fill out forms. There can be reconciliation issues between multiple systems. So if you have multiple systems that are recording aspects of information relative to one person or one entity, there can be some like fragmentation problems. And so these are, these are long running problems that have been happening for hundreds of years in government. So I think the thing is that people are most excited about is sort of asking that perennial question, is this the technology that's going to allow me to solve some of these perennial problems in government? And in a lot of cases, the answer is the technology very much can, actually. So a very simple example is uh, we do a lot of work with folks in the health and human services side. And for a lot of individuals, there's a very complex array of services that they benefit from, that they can take advantage of, generally with a pretty high level of security and compliance. So that's health data, some of that's criminal justice data, some of that's other kind of social, social service data, generally held in different systems that don't have a long history of talking to each other. But, you know, one of the really exciting things about these highly secure cloud native data management capabilities that now exist is actually the prospect of bringing that data together is now practically achievable in a way that has been historically impossible. And so, you know, any new technology expands the horizon of what can't be done uh, and really pushes forward sort of the art of the possible. And so then it's just a question of procurement, of implementation, of policy and of culture, right? So... In a lot of cases, what we're seeing, government's extremely excited about looking and saying, hey, it is actually possible for us to build a more citizen-centric view of the world and to make citizen services more cohesive, to make sure that different agencies are better able to communicate and share information with one another. So that, that remains, I think, the goal and the thing that people are most excited about. And it's really a question of, can that be implemented? Can that be achieved? And that's really some combination of technology and best practice and cultural shift to say, uh, to get people more comfortable with sharing this kind of information. There's one of my favorite projects that you work on is with Fulton County. And, uh, you know, this is actually one of the major initiatives they have going on is sharing information between social service providers, between hospitals, between the county sheriff, really to identify certain individuals who may have interactions with the criminal justice system, but who also are receiving social services through other means and making sure that those individuals are maybe routed to diversionary care or get put into some kind of social support instead of jail, which in many cases lead to better outcomes for the individual and a lot of cost savings for the jurisdiction. So, you know, when I look forward, a lot of the things that people are really excited about is really solving some of these perennial problems in government, moving forward, the ability to make things a little bit more cohesive, a little bit more centralized. And then, of course, AI also kind of shows up in that realm of, hey, I, w I wonder what's possible. I wonder if that can help us with some things as well. Yeah, I love that you bring up Fulton County and we will get to AI in a minute. But I think one of the big misconceptions for residents is when you think of this idea of government, you think, okay, it's one, it's one entity, like it's the government's problem, they're going to take care of it for me. And as we know, that is not accurate. You mentioned, okay, different agencies within Fulton County who are working towards one common goal to serve a resident. We've talked on this podcast about how I can get my license from one organization, but I vote through a different agency. And then I have to send my kids to a different department for public school education and how they're, they're fragmented in a lot of ways. And even you just saying like a piece of paper can get lost. Imagine a piece of paper traveling through all of those different departments. There's this big misconception for everyday residents that government is one thing and government is many, has vast capabilities. And a lot of what happens with data management software solutions is that it's an attempt to connect those dots. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and not even just government, right? You know, in that Fulton County example, a lot of those agencies are maybe nonprofits, maybe they're private or semi-private hospitals. So it's really the, you know, you are totally right. There's this sort of magical view that people have of like, oh, there's some magical machine somewhere in the background in government that knows everything and manages all this information. Uh, and that, that simply does not exist. And in some ways, it would be kind of amazing if it did. And in other ways, it would be probably less than ideal if it did. There's good and bad for every option. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the, the idea that you can bring this information together and also bring in people outside of government in a well-managed and secure way, I mean, that's a pretty incredible innovation, right? That's really a huge shift in terms of what's possible around policy delivery. Because ultimately, you know, we live in a pluralistic society. One of the, the true hallmarks of American society is not just that government goes at it alone, but that there are this array of 
nonprofits, social service providers, private entities, companies, citizen organizations, all of whom participate in, in the construction of our society and the delivery of services. So the idea that you can really build programs and build information systems that actually kind of match that complexity without costing 10 years to make and hundreds of billions of dollars to put together is really pretty incredible. It's, a, it's an amazing shift. Yeah. What was that phrase you said? It was practically possible. What was previously impossible? Is that the phrase you used? Yeah, something like that. I think it's great and really points out where government is right now in terms of technical capabilities, that there is so much opportunity that was not possible before. We'll be right back to our conversation. I hope you're enjoying listening to this episode of the Tyler Tech Podcast. In today's rapidly evolving digital public sector, data isn't just helpful, it's pivotal. Quality data is the backbone of government functions, and in today's world, effectively using data increases government's impact and deepens engagement with residents. Tyler recently published an ebook titled A Digital Government Guide to Effective Data Strategies. This ebook helps leaders at any stage of their data journey. The ebook explores eight core benefits of effective data use, as well as real world examples from the San Diego Association of Governments, the state of New Jersey, and Claremont County, Ohio. Whether you're just beginning to realize your data's potential or you're venturing into integrative analytics, this ebook is designed to guide you through the data field process. And by the end, you'll discover why data strategy is crucial, how governments can envision and actualize data programs, and you'll even receive expert recommendations for a clear data path. Your journey through this guide will affirm one truth. The power of data, when harnessed, can transform the impact of government. Download this ebook now by clicking the link in our show notes. Now let's get back to the Tyler Tech Podcast. So you mentioned the great buzzword. You mentioned AI. There's a lot of talk in this industry right now. I think every conversation I've had since becoming one of the hosts on this podcast has somehow included AI. And there's a lot of work that we think of as traditional government work that's been rooted in data science and not AI or generative AI. But there's obviously a ton of opportunity there. So can you talk about the opportunities you see for governments to build on or expand their data science capabilities with AI? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the first thing to understand is that AI is part of a continuum, right? There's AI is not different than data science. And data science is not different than statistics exactly. You can think of data science as really fast statistics at a certain level, and AI is really fast data science. This would be a very simple way to think about it. But a lot of the core requirements to do any kind of analysis are very common, right? You need data of reasonable quality. That data needs to be accessible. You need to handle your privacy and security concerns, and you need to make sure that that data remains up to date. So a lot of those core infrastructure problems are really the same, regardless of the type of analysis that you're doing. I think what's really changed is that seeing things like ChatGPT mid-journey, I mean, there's this dizzying array of tools that started to crop up really all around us in this sort of moment of extreme hype that we're in, more justified hype maybe than in previous years. So there is a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I think the biggest thing is changes people's mental models have changed. The idea of like, oh, maybe this is possible. Maybe I could have this system that creates a conversational interface around all of this different data. And maybe I can do that pretty quickly. So we're still in this kind of very early moment, this very exploratory moment when it comes to generative AI. And really understanding what does that actually mean for us? What are the best suited opportunities? So you can think about it a lot like when we started shifting from on-premise hosted to cloud hosted systems, there was a million things that people thought might, you know, be kind of a killer app. And in a lot of cases, it was email was like kind of the first thing that moved over that really changed people's lives. And similarly in AI and in this world of generative AI, those killer apps are things that are getting worked on right now. Those are things that are going to be coming over the next, you know, the coming months and years. I think the pace of change is going to be phenomenal when we look over the next maybe three to five years. There's so much investment coming into this world of AI and uh, so many opportunities that are getting unlocked. Just to, for some very simple ones, you know, we do a lot of work around government transparency. And a lot of that transparency work is rooted in the idea that we're going to go find the data in your systems. We're going to scrub it and apply our privacy rules, things like that. And then we're going to make that information public. The challenge you often run into in those kind of traditional transparency programs is it can be pretty difficult for citizens to interpret that data. So one of the experiments that we're doing in-house right now and one of the projects that we're working on is basically training models 
to, we're actually trying two different approaches. One, to look at data across many different governments in a, in a common domain. So for example, looking at assessment data across many different governments and training a model that knows how to interpret and, and kind of communicate around that data. One of the most common types of transparency programs is if you're a homeowner and you want to look up information about your parcel, about your property, you have to go somewhere online to look that up. Well, that's a great case for a chat model, kind of a conversational AI kind of model. The other side of that we're looking at is could we train a model on all of the data for a single jurisdiction so that it can maybe route citizens to appropriate government services and tell them what is or is not available in their particular jurisdiction. There's still some, some challenges in terms of taking that live. Uh, hallucination is a pretty well-known problem. So most conversational AIs at this point still have an error rate that's probably a little bit on the high side for our level of comfort. Obviously, you don't want to end up in a situation where a citizen is misled or a conversation maybe goes down a path that you really don't want a government website going down. So there's a lot of guardrails that are getting put in place there. There's a lot of work that's happening to drive that. So I think that's probably the thing that'll come first is working with public data in particular and really communicating with citizens and helping to guide them to either the services or answers to questions. If I were to guess, I would say I think that's probably the thing that's going to come most quickly in terms of that's a really common aspect of what governments are doing and is really impactful and meaningful change in how citizens interact with government. But the opportunity is way, way bigger than that. A lot of it has to do with not just how we communicate with citizens, but also how governments run their own operations. Going back to that comment about, hey, how do we miss data? Well, you can create really effective algorithms that can match data. Hey, what happens if, you know, can we maybe automate filling out forms? Can we maybe automate some of our process through some smarter technology? So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in terms of government efficiency, pace of process. And then an area that's a personal passion, obviously working at the Data and Insights Division, is there's a tremendous amount of ability within AI to basically run statistics and use a model that's created through very complicated math to run different complicated math and help you find things about your data and about your operations. So this is already being used in a lot of cases in a low-level way for security systems. And so there's a lot of active monitoring systems that look at you know all of the activity happening throughout a jurisdiction and then trying to use AI and anomaly detection to say, hey, it's kind of strange that this individual whose normal pattern of use is this is looking at this information at 2 in the morning from an IP address in Russia. Maybe we should do something about that. Um, Just a little that's, strange, you know? Yeah, right? But that can be extended into all other aspects of government operations. So in payment processing to do to identify fraud or anomalies in that data, you know, procurement data, there's a lot of ways that you can build security and protection using AI in that world. And then even just for policymakers, you know, the ability to quickly ask questions and find outliers, identify trends. There really is an infinite world of opportunity. I think some of those things are going to happen faster than others. You know, anything that's working with public data, you have less of a security and a privacy and a sort of data security concern. So my guess is a lot of those things are going to happen faster. But there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and a tremendous amount of space for uh, really government operations to be transformed through the use of these AI technologies. Yeah, and we're, we are excited to be a part of it. And you know, obviously, as Tyler, we have access to a vast array of data. All the clients that are using our you know, tens of thousands of installed systems across the world or across the United States. So we're really looking at how we can take advantage of all of that data and build some incredibly cool insights for our clients and for those who are using Tyler systems to understand how they stack up relative to others, to maybe understand global trends or national trends and how those might be impacting a particular jurisdiction. I, I think the, the universe of opportunity is, is vast. I feel like you just offered so many points of inspiration for our listeners. Like you went from assessors offices to individual citizen experiences all over the place that any of our public sector listeners can really just say, I have an idea that came out of this. You had said something really helpful about how the speed and the pace of technology is really going to increase. And that is one of the coolest things right now, that there's so much computing power that wasn't available previously that is allowing these solutions to just like rapidly roll out. You you said that the, the killer apps are being created right now. And that's so true. There is just... I feel like we could talk for hours about every different option. Even just my mind is spinning with everything you just shared. The idea of being able to compare parcels, not only in your local county, but across different counties around the country or across your state and using that for comparables. The ability to have 
a government website be more easily navigated through a chat bot, pulling information from that government website. I just think that there's something for every one of our public sector listeners to be able to say, oh, I could start implementing that or I could start thinking about that right now. So we've talked about the kind of like past 10 years. We can look forward to another 10 years though and say, where do you see government data analysis and management 10 years from now, especially as we're thinking about the pace in which solutions are showing up, rolling out and being implemented? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, as you said, the there's this sort of interesting compounding effect that uh, that is happening in technology right now, which is, you know, if you think about like when the database was introduced, you know, it took maybe 20 years for that to really reach a point of maturity and broad adoption. You know, cloud technologies, it's maybe been 10, 12 years. That cycle is shrinking. It's really getting shorter and shorter. So that pace from a technology is introduced to the sort of first killer apps are introduced to widespread adoption to sort of pervasiveness. That cycle is shrinking more quickly than ever. And I think, as I mentioned, the most important thing is I think we're going to start to see a lot of divergence among, because in order to take advantage of AI, in order to take advantage of these next generation technologies, you have to have your foundation in order. And your foundation is the quality and accessibility of the data that you have. And those governments that have made those investments are going to find it very easy to take advantage of everything that's to come. You have your data in a well-managed place. You have your security rules implemented in an accessible way. The cost to implement right, a new AI technology can be relatively low. It's one of the cool things about how these systems are getting built. The, the costs are also coming down very quickly. I mean, a chat GPT for membership for an organization is, you know, 20 bucks a month. There are obviously more things to do than just paying the 20 bucks to take advantage of it, but the costs have gotten really low. But for those governments who haven't made those foundational investments, that's going to start to have a compounding effect. It's going to be not just that you don't have that core access to data, but all of the other things you might want to do with it are going to get harder and harder and more expensive and more expensive longer and longer. Down. So I really do see, we start to see a lot of divergence where those governments that are making those investments that are really trying to stay ahead of the game and really tackle maybe some longstanding issues around data quality, data access, data security, really have a huge opportunity to leapfrog you know, the current state of citizen experience. Whereas those who haven't made those investments are going to find it more and more expensive to keep up. You know, but when I look ahead 10 years, there's always a background in government, which is citizen expectation. It's not maybe something that we talk about a lot, but it's certainly something that, that public sector employees are deeply aware of. You know, when Google became widely available, it became a citizen expectation that they could just Google stuff about their government and find information very readily. When that meant that technologies like PDFs and things of that nature became a lot less attractive, right? Because you can't Google inside a PDF. Similarly, I think that that change in citizen expectation is going to be just absolutely incredible over the next 20 years. I think any government that five years from now is still relying on any kind of paper process is going to find a combination of rising citizen expectations and generational change. It's going to lead to a lot of problems. I think really we're going to see that full shift to not just digital native, but digital only government. I think we're going to see really transformative change in terms of how citizens interact with governments. I think even the idea of a single government website as that point of access may fade out over the next 10 years. You could totally imagine a world where states or the federal government is offering single interfaces that can access the information of many different governments and route citizens in more central ways. So once again, we are at this sort of precipice where we can see maybe not exactly where we're going, but all of the ways in which the world might change. You know, this is a, a really incredible moment in terms of like a new technology that has nearly unlimited potential. We're all just, you know, together, working together, heads around it and understand what that means and what the opportunities are and where we should go next. So really over the next 10 years, I think the big thing is, yeah, that kind of divergence between those that are maybe riding the wave and those that aren't. And then just that radical change in citizen expectation that's going to put a lot more pressure on those in the public sector to make information more accessible, make process more accessible and really fully make that shift away from the paper process and paper mindset to something that is more self-service, more digitally native, more accessible to citizens. Mm -hmm. I think the call out for citizen expectations shaping what government services are is so important. The march of technology is going to continue. People do not want to fill out paper forms. I, for example, was sent a PDF and asked to fill it out, but I need to download it, print it, and then upload it back. And I'm avoiding that task because that seems more difficult than I want it to be instead of just inputting it into a digital system. So if I am irritated by that now, think about how people who are coming into the workforce 10, 15 years from now are going to feel about that. 
And I love the call out you had about having a solid data foundation. I think that that's something we really have tried to empower our clients with here at Tyler, making sure that they have good data governance policy, that they've been able to really work in in the culture of their government to make sure that there's an understanding of why data quality matters, because you don't want to train an AI model on bad data. Hallucinations are one thing, but having the wrong information within that AI model is going to create a disaster for everyone who's involved. And it's something that I think our public sector listeners can focus on now instead of thinking, okay, well, we don't have the budget right now to employ some type of AI solution. You can work on data quality. You can work on having good data governance policies in place and making sure that your data management permissions are set up correctly and data sharing permissions are set up correctly. So there is a little bit of like, you can do it now type information for our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the best way to, you know, get ready for the future is to make sure your house is in order. And you're you're ready for you know ready for the guests to come if you will. <laughs> the AI guests are coming. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, Kyle, there's so much that we could talk about, but I do want to thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Tyler Tech Podcast. Of course, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to chat. We've spoken a lot about data and AI on this podcast recently, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Governments are poised to take advantage of innovative technology to create more efficiencies in their systems and better support their communities, but it starts with the data you have currently. Tyler creates solutions made exclusively for the public sector and has experts with government experience ready to support you on this journey. I hope you're excited about what the future holds and will reach out to us at podcast at tylertech.com to be connected with an expert like Kyle, if you'd like to learn more. For Tyler Technologies, I'm Beth Amon. Thanks for joining the Tyler Tech Podcast. We're looking to learn more about you and what you want to hear more of on the Tyler Tech Podcast. Fill out our audience survey in the show notes today to let us know how you heard of the show and what you want more of. And don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. 